Okay, so it's time, and uh, let's start our KO Global Research Institute uh, lecture series. So today uh, we uh, have a, a lecture, uh, Professor uh, Bernardino Ogetti, and uh, I am very happy and proud uh, that we have invited our uh, Professor Getty uh, to Keio University. And um, as everybody knows that uh, Professor Getty is a specialist of tau and uh, FTLD, a front temple or lower degeneration. And uh, he is currently the professor, distinguished professor, uh, Indiana University School of Medicine, uh, Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. And maybe I do not need to introduce him here uh, in English, so I'll switch to Japanese. And Getty Sensei wa ima genzai ano Indiana Daigaku no で、で、その後、1970年からえ、で、最初あの、1976年から、え、パソロジーのアシスタントプロフェッサー。で、あの、さらにパソロジーとサイカイアトリーのアシスタントプロフェッサー。そして、え、1983年から、え、プロフェッサーパソロジーアンドサイカイ
神経内科におられます高尾正樹先生が高尾先生があのアメリカに留学しておられた時の、えー、とボスということで、えー、まあ非常にあの熱い進行が終わりだと思いますけれども、まあ、そのようなあのことでこういうようなあの形でインバイトさせていただいたということです。であの今日お話をいただきます内容は、えー、The Emergence of Tao in Understanding of Front Temporal Dementia ということで、えー、前頭側頭型認知症の理解、えー、におけるあの Tao の問題ということであります。であのまあ、これはあのゲーティ教授がもう長年にあたって中心的なテーマとしてやってこられたあのことだとは思いますけれどもまあどちらかというとあのそこにとどまらずあの幅広くえと我々あのまあニューロサイエンスをやっているものに対してえと少しあのいろんな刺激的なお話もいただきたいとこういうふうにはあの思っております。All of the audience here, and、uh, I'd like you to give us an、um, updated information about Tao and、uh, FTD. But、uh, I would like to ask you to give us an,、uh, some kind of your、um, insight about the neuroscience per se. So, not only limited to the、uh, neuropathology. You have、um, a wide range of f i e l d of experience of neurology and、uh, psychiatry also. He has been educated in a psychoanalytic、uh, field. So、uh, I would like to. So here、uh, we do have an,、uh, young investigators, investigators and、uh, doctors. So I would like、uh, you to give us an. Uh, your、uh, some kind of uh, uh, insight uh, about the future of the neuroscience. Okay,、uh, thank you very much. So I'll go ahead, Professor Getty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mimura.、Um, so this is a challenge for me <laughs> to talk about the future. Well, let me try. First, with some of my work, and then maybe we can discuss together about what the future is uh, uh, going to give us. So, I thought that we can start talking about、uh, Arnold p i c k who was a psychiatrist. And he was trained by Otto Westphal, and he was the head of the Department of Psychiatry between 1886 and 1921. When I、uh, started my training in neurology and psychiatry,、uh, we knew. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This one? This. We knew only you know, three diseases Alzheimer's disease, p i c k disease, and Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Now the field has expanded, so we have so many different forms of dementia. But、um, the, I think it's the importance of p i c k I will try to explain.、Uh, His life and career exemplify the integration of neurology, psychiatry, and neuropathology, which represents one of the major contributions of German neuropsychiatry to the study of the nervous system. p i c k is a major intellectual ancestor of present day behavioral neurology. He's the one who really focused and developed the concept of circumscribed lobar atrophy. In his paper of 1892, he studied several patients, but these are the most、uh, relevant 
that he described in his papers. Uh, Joseph Lazak uh, in 1906. Actually, uh, let's see, there should have one before this. August age, 1892. He started at age 69. They described mental weakness, aggressiveness, apathy, and speech difficulty. Brain was atrophic, 1150. There was difference between right and left hemisphere. Left hemisphere was more atrophic. And uh, there was temporal lobe atrophy. Uh, and uh, atrophic with the left being worse than the right. 30 grams difference, yeah. Died at age 71. The brain was studied by Hans Chiari. This is the other patient also who presented severe atrophy of the frontal lobes, mm -hmm. left inferior parietal lobule, mild atrophy of the right inferior parietal lobule, and bilateral temporal and occipital lobes. He died at 60 years of age. So, one step back, durante those years, there was a great development in the field of neuroscience. The Italian Camillo Golgi in 1873 discovered the so-called black reaction. He could impregnate neurons, see the neurons. This is one of his drawing. Of course, Golgi is also very well known for the Golgi apparatus, but this is one uh, the discovery of this technique allowed a study of the central nervous system that was not available, was not possible before, with the impregnation of individual nerve cells. This is a modern uh, modification of the Golgi method. Uh, Ramonica Hall wanted to modify Golgi's method. And here again, we have a, an image of the hippocampus. At the time, there was no camera, so they were drawing. And this is the hippocampus with the technique that Cajal had modified. So this was a very interesting time. Many other very important uh, scientists, like Nissel, we're studying the structure of the brain, the anatomy. But I want to focus on this technique, silver technique, because shortly after 1902, between 1902 and 1904, Max Bielschowski tried to modify, improve Cajal's method. And uh, nowadays, I started my work in neuropathology using Bielschowski method. So Cajal, in, in his book that has been recently translated in English, advice for a young investigator, but was previously tra translated, precepts and counsels in scientific investigation, stimulants of the spirit. So Cajal gives uh, suggestions to the young investigator and he says, uh, says that it may be stated that the great discoveries are in the hands of the finest and the most knowledgeable experts on one or more of the analytical methods. And Alzheimer, in 1906, using the Wielschowski method, discovered the neurofibrillary tangles in August D. Brain. The disease that we call Alzheimer's disease is characterized by neurofibrillary tangles and plaques. The plaques were studied, dis discovered before. Alzheimer saw this patient who had both lesions. But his great innovation is discovery of the neurofibrillary tangles in the neurons using the Bielschowski method that was a modification of the Golgi and Cajal methods. Golgi and Cajal got the Nobel Prize in 1906. Alzheimer discovered the disease, reported for the first time in 1906. 
this patient that now everybody knows. So this is Agosti in a picture of 1902. These are the drawings that um, Alzheimer did with the Bielchowski method. But Alzheimer was a very inquisitive mind. And so when he discovered this, he said, we must not be satisfied to force what we find into the existing group of well-known disease patterns. It is clear that there is exist many more mental diseases than our textbooks indicate. In many such cases, a further histological examination must be affected to determine the characteristic of each single case. And in fact, Alzheimer himself, a few years later, discovered another disease with the same method, with the Bielchowski method. So here are the neurofibrillary tangles, and here are the peak bodies. This is the discovery that he did 1906, the paper came out also in 1907. Then additional papers by his fellow uh, Italian uh, Perusini. And then in, in 1911, this disease. The patient was Therese Mulich. So 1911, she was demented. Severe atrophy of the middle and inferior temporal gyri, absence of neuritic plaques, and presence of round shaped inclusions, the peak bodies. So, uh, additional patients have been studied later by other investigators, and gradually the concept of um, frontotemporal lobar degeneration expanded. Uh, this is a patient by Altman. And the name peak bodies started to be used in the literature. Then for many years, the peak disease has been a very complex um, uh, diagnosis and pathologically not so well characterized. The name peak atrophy was used in, in 1922, peak disease finally in 26, and in 33, peak lobar sclerosis. The term frontotemporal lobar degeneration emphasized the predominant and distinct features of frontal and temporal atrophy that is associated with a multiplicity of clinical syndromes referred as frontotemporal dementias. So this is the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. You can appreciate that there is a diffuse atrophy, while, uh, and, and here by immunohistochemistry, today we can do this section, stain them with amyloid beta antibodies, tau antibodies, and you see the extensive involvement uh, by histology, this is a silver method. This is a modification of uh, the Bielchowski. This is the Bodian method. This is thioflavin that shows fluorescent tangles. And this is immunohistochemistry with antibody to tau that shows the cell body full of tau, but also this um, neuropil threads. And this is now a very complex uh, situation to understand. And we'll try, as I go forward, to um, clarify some of these characteristic lesions. Peak disease is quite different. As you can see, there is a tremendous severe frontal atrophy. The peak bodies are shown here with silver method, Bodian. And many, many different 
part of the central nervous system, particularly frontal and temporal, but also hippocampus are affected. And here you can see the fascia dentata of the hippocampus with large number of peak bodies. You can appreciate nicely, for instance, in this cell, this is the nucleus, and this is peak body. Nucleus, peak body. Nucleus, peak body. And this is another area, uh, pyramidal layer of the hippocampus, again, with these large round inclusions. So techniques developed. And as you can see here, 1963, uh, Michael Kidd published this paper and these images of filaments using the electron microscope. And Robert Terry, who was my mentor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, published these images showing uh, the, this filamentous material from the neurofibrillary tangles. There was a difference of opinion between the two, because Kidd thought that these were paired helical filaments, while Terry called them twisted tubules. Um, in reality, at the time, you know, the cytoskeleton was known only in part, and the organelles that were known were the neurofilaments and the microtubules. So one cell twisted tubules, the other perilical filaments, thinking about the neurofilaments. But in reality, now we know that these filaments are something very different. So electron microscopy was also very helpful to study the peak bodies. Here, while I was at Albert Einstein, Dr. Wisniewski and Terry published this paper showing a peak body here, and this is the filaments of the peak bodies. So both neurofibrillary tangles and peak bodies have this filamentous material. And now we are in the 60s and 70s, and then um, uh, PIC was still being classified. Constantinidis, for instance, uh, was talking about PIC disease type A, type B, type C, neuronal loss, gliosis, PIC bodies. In B, neuronal loss, swollen neurons. In C, neuronal loss and gliosis. So now we know that what was classified as peak disease um, was a mixture of different type of frontotemporal lobar degeneration, uh, some with the peak bodies, some without peak bodies. We'll see what are the ones with peak bodies and the ones without them. So uh, the school. Um, Various school evolved. Frontal lobe degeneration of non-Alzheimer type was introduced in 1987. And uh, 94, the Lund and Manchester group talked about frontal lobe degeneration type, peak type, motor neuron disease type. And that already tells us something very interesting. Um, we start to delineate a different nosography. But uh, just to stay focused on the topic of tau, which was my original intention, now we have, in 1975, the very important discovery by Kirchner Laboratory, the discovery of the protein tau. So, a protein factor essential for microtubule assembly. And uh, a few years later, in 1986, the identification of the gene coding for tau in chromosome 17. Okay. Now, if you have any question, please interrupt. If there is something before going forward, I'm happy to 
clarify if something is not clear. The concept of involvement of this new protein tau in Alzheimer's disease and in peak disease started in the middle 80s. Uh, Brion, for the first time, showed the presence of immunopositivity in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. Uh, Dr. Grunk Iqbal and Khalid Iqbal showed the phosphorylation of the microtubule-associated protein tau. And this became a very, very important point, because now we know that you know, the protein tau as accumulates, you know, it is separated by, from the microtubules, becomes progressively hyperphosphorylated and forms filaments. And then here we have this uh, letter to the editor in Lancet showing the immunopositivity of the peak bodies using antibodies to tau. Then the group uh, at the Medical Research Council in Cambridge uh, progressed with extremely important work showing the first the cloning and sequencing of the cDNA encoding the core a protein of the paired helical filaments of Alzheimer's disease. This is the work by Dr. Godert and collaborators. Then the isolation of a fragment of tau from the core of the periodical filaments. And then the demonstration of multiple isoform of the human microtubule associated protein tau. Now we know that tau has, the protein tau has six different isoforms. And then, um, we started studying a family in the early 90s. Uh, I uh, found this family where there was only tau pathology. They were demented. They were followed for some generation. No diagnosis was ever made. And when I saw the first brain autopsy, I saw it was something that I'd never seen before only tau in nerve cells and glia. So we call it this multiple system tauopathy because the tau was involving many anatomical area of the central nervous system and was involving not only nerve cells, but also astrocyte and oligodendroglia. Uh, we, um, we uh, did further studies on this family. And then uh, there was the discovery of the gene that in 1998 came out. In, in the same month of June, these three papers were published. We published our family finding a mutation, a mutation that is located in the um, intron following exon 10. And here, this large group of people, so many different families with mutations in tronic and in exons. And this is also one mutation. We will now go more in detail. So this is our family called multiple system tauopathy. As you can see, is a large pedigree with a dominant disease. The first patient that I saw pathologically started to have uh, symptoms at age 55, died at 58. She had uh, uh, dizziness that was exacerbated by head movements, memory problems, difficulty swallowing. swallowing. She had a limitation of superior gaze and other neurological symptoms. There was not much at the time known about psychiatric, a psychiatric component. Um, she had two daughters who unfortunately uh, developed the same disorder 
and I did the autopsy of both of them just during the last few months. So this was um, in 93, I, see, I saw this case, and now the two daughters. What was striking, as I said, was the presence of tau, absence of uh, plaques, and then this severe pathology in the white matter. I had never seen that. So many cells, oligodendroglial cells, particularly with uh, tau accumulation in the cytoplasm and in the uh, processes. By electromicroscopy, immune electromicroscopy, I found these filaments that were like ribbons. Um, as you can see, wide and narrow, different from the periodical filaments of Alzheimer's disease uh, for the periodicity and the width of the filaments. The atrophy can be extreme in this disorder. Here is one of the cases that we retrieved uh, from uh, a psychiatric facility where a patient from this family had been um, for many years. And again, this is the image of the neurons and glia. So as you can appreciate with higher power, the tau can be seen diffused throughout the cytoplasm, extending into the dendrites, and eventually in some different uh, anatomical areas. Here we are in the hippocampus, forming a ring around the nucleus. And here we have a cell that now is quite shrunken, very atrophic, but with abundance of um, tau by immunohistochemistry. The tau deposits are present also in glia. This is called tufted astrocyte. We have a large amount of tau uh, proximally to the nucleus, while here the tau is in distal processes. These are called coiled bodies. These are characteristically uh, characteristic of the oligodendroglia. So what I showed you um, was basically the evolution of something that had started a few years before. As I said, the gene was found in 98. In 96, two years before, there was a consensus conference where um, People brought families that had linkage to chromosome 17. So this was the first study, 1994, with linkage of one family uh, to this uh, chromosome 17. That family was presented at the consensus conference. And then uh, we presented our family also chromosome 17. So at the time, um, this was really the first uh, biological genetic uh, and molecular genetic work taking place in this group of diseases. And here there are all the families that were presented at this consensus conference in Ann Arbor. And all of them really pointed toward a very small area in chromosome 17. But interestingly, what happened was that not everybody had done neuropathology in these cases. Only some had done neuropathology showing tau. Other groups had not done tau. And so there was a question whether they were all part of the same group or not. Here is a schematic um, representation of the 
tau protein. And um, I'm presenting this at this point because it's important to understand the mutations that have been found. So there are three isoform with three repeat. This three and four repeat. So this is a motif uh, that is repeated three or four times. That is the site of binding to the microtubules. Tau stabilizes the microtubules. It's very important for the maintenance stabilization of microtubules. If tau does not bind to the microtubule, the microtubule cannot remain, cannot function. So now the mechanism of splicing is such that exon 10 is the one that is present or absent in these isoforms. But also, there are other splicing of exon 2 and 3. And so the combination are such that six isoforms are uh, present. It is not entirely clear whether they are present 50-50 in nerve cells. There is a possibility that different neurons in different anatomical areas may have a different percent of isoforms. So this is still something that should be investigated. Um, uh, Dr. Spillantini basically uh, knowing this concept of the six isoform studied in depth our family of multiple system tauopathy with different antibody isolating the filaments and doing immunoelectron microscopy of the filaments and so she concluded that the filament in uh, multiple system tauopathy were composed by only uh, four repeat tau. So this was very different from what had been seen before in Alzheimer's disease. Because in Alzheimer's disease, the filaments contain all six isoforms. So this was clearly a quite different situation. And the mutation, in fact, the mutation that was found in our family is in this region that is regulating the splicing mechanism of exon 10. By the presence of the mutation, more splicing of exon 10 occurs, and therefore, the tau with four repeat is what is um, accumulating and forming the filaments. Any question? Okay. So we publish ex extensively on this family the this, uh, uh, anatomical distribution of lesions throughout the central nervous system. And here in this slide, there is again the list of all these families that were presented at the consensus conference. And interestingly, as you can see, there are several different mutations in tau. But three families were not, although they were linked to uh, chromosome 17, did not have tau pathology. These three did not have tau pathology. So I will tell you now, because we will not have time to talk about this part of the story, is that this family, yes, they have a mutation in uh, chromosome 17, but it's a mutation in granulin. Granulin gene is very close to tau. So that is why the linkage was, for all of them, chromosome 17, but 
is a totally different uh, gene that causes frontotemporal lobar degeneration and it causes atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobe. And many of those cases have language disorder similar to what Peak had seen in his own cases. So both uh, granulin and tau causes a frontotemporal lobar degeneration, but with very different biological characteristics. The granulin eventually uh, causes a disease with the accumulation of a protein called TDP43. I'm sure you have heard about TDP43 that regulates RNA. It's a very interesting, different protein. So that's why the field of frontotemporal dementia has you know, uh, developed in a way that was so unexpected. Uh, I did this cartoon to summarize where the mutations in tau are. So they are, this on X on one have not been really confirmed. Uh, so the best recognized are in uh, exon 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And now I want to explain something. When the mutations are in the intron here, basically, there is no change in the protein itself. There is only a change in the ratio between 3 and 4 repeat. When you have the mutation here, the splicing, exon 10, and therefore a tauopathy with four repeat. While mutations in this 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 can give the different uh, pathologic phenotypes, they can, and I will show you in a moment, have a tau pathology that can be either only three repeat or only four repeat or both three and four repeat, like in Alzheimer's disease. But in this case, the protein is mutated. While in this case, when the, the mutation is the, in the intron, there's no mutation in the protein. There's only different ratio of the isoform. So we have tauopathies now with three repeat, four repeat, and three and four repeat. And they can be hereditary or sporadic. Peak disease is a tauopathy with three repeat only, and it can be seen, most cases are sporadic. And many cases of peak disease are seen by psychiatrists first, because they have behavioral changes, et cetera, and then eventually the organic nature of the disease is discovered. Alzheimer, well, we know well, uh, has the 3 and 4 repeat, but the same 3 and 4 repeat can be seen in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is a topic that is very much discussed now, particularly in the United States, because football playing, et cetera, et cetera. And then the four repeat is progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, argyrophilic grain disease, and then the tauopathies, uh, hereditary tauopathies that I have discussed with you. So the filaments in the inclusions are different. These are the paradigmal filaments. These are the filaments of the four repeat with this ribbon type of shape, and these are the three repeat, like in peak bodies, where we have wide and narrow filaments. So let me show you some cases. For example, this is a young man who, at age 22, became a bit withdrawn socially. At 25, he lost job. Uh, he developed stereotypes stereotypical behavior. Atrophy was seen by MRI. The disease progressed 
At 27, reduced attention span, difficulties with simple abstract reasoning, social conduct deteriorated, disinhibition, theft, violation of interpersonal space, hyperorality, so a lot of different psychiatric symptoms, uh, and A28 psychiatric unit was therapy with chlorpromazine because basically nothing was clear here, could not be understood what it was going on. Only at the autopsy, when he died at 33, he died of aspiration pneumonia, actually at 36. Um, so at that point, uh, it was clear that he had a tauopathy. We looked at the brain, and there were neurofibrillary tangles similar to those seen in Alzheimer's disease. But there was also pathology of the glia by uh, immunoblot. This, as you can see, the six isoforms. This is Alzheimer's disease. This is the family of multiple system tauopathy, where we have only these two bands here. Here we have only the four repeat tau. While in this case, this young man had a mutation in tau G335S. And basically, as you can see, he has similar to Alzheimer's disease, the pattern of migration of tau. So practically, in this case, we have tau with all six isoforms. And there are other mutations, like, for instance, the 406 mutation in tau gene that has neurofibrillary tangles, identical to those of Alzheimer's disease, at least by light microscopy. I say at least by light microscopy because I will show you how the progress in understanding the tangles has developed in the last couple of years that shows us really profound differences of the filaments. So, Having a mutation in tau here, I don't know whether, yes, we have three and four repeat tau, six isoform, but is the conformation of the protein the same or not? So here, this was another case. Here is the p 3 s mutation. This, we found it in a, in a family where the father had been in psychiatric hospital, these were old preparations from the psychiatric hospital. We did immunohistochemistry. There was tau. The son presented at 27 with a syndrome that was interpreted as corticobasal syndrome. The father had depression, memory loss, apathy, indifference, self-neglect, auditory hallucination, persecutory delusion. And he was in a psychiatric hospital, died at 36. The son uh, developed a different picture and was very puzzling. At that point, knowing father and son had both a neurological disease early in life, we found the mutation. Uh, the mother did not want the autopsy of the son, so we never saw what was the final picture. So in this form, uh, though, other cases have been seen. And there is presence of a mostly four repeat tau, but there is also some of three repeat. Um, from that mutation, a mouse was generated. And Dr. Goddard has been studying this now for many years. There are other. Uh, cases of uh, mutations where the picture clinically and pathologically is that of peak disease. So here, for instance, we have a case where um, we studied this person. And we learned through family investigation that this was biological uh, son of this actually was an uncle. So there was other paternity. He developed his disease in his 
early 30s. Uh, toward the end of the disease, the atrophy was extremely severe, and we found a mutation at codon 389. So here we have a picture, tau mutation, with a clinical presentation and pathologic presentation of peak disease. Uh, similarly, here we have a case in which there is a deletion at position 280. And again, here, see the severe atrophy. We have peak disease, classic peak disease. With uh, the use of antibodies, one can learn quite a bit. This is the silver stain showing the peak bodies. They are not fluorescent. We can see a light um, presence, but they are not fluorescent, unlike the neurofibrillary tangles of Alzheimer. But using antibody, this is a, a tau antibody uh, that recognizes hyperphosphorylated tau. And you can see the peak bodies here. With three repeat tau, you see them, but not with four repeat tau antibody. So the immunohistochemistry using different antibodies is very helpful to uh, recognize the uh, pathologic phenotype and which type of tauopathy we are dealing with. This was a drawing of a patient who was diagnosed for many years as frontotemporal dementia, who developed this skill in drawing and painting. But with my great surprise, when I did the autopsy, she had Alzheimer's disease. So this is something very interesting. Several cases present with the frontotemporal symptoms, language, or behavior, and then Surprise, they have Alzheimer's disease. So I did a synthesis uh, of findings. The tau mutation have a very uh, complex presentation. Uh, they can be different in terms of severity of the atrophy, as you can see. This is a mutation that shows the six isoform. This is a peak, so three repeat isoform. This is four repeat. So you can see the difference in the atrophy. But also, the length of the disease can be very different. This can last many, many years, while these forms are much more aggressive uh, than uh, as you can see, in a few years, the atrophy becomes extremely severe. Imaging today is challenging. Uh, there is imaging for tau in Alzheimer's disease, while the tau uh, imaging for the three repeat and four repeat is less well developed at this moment. So this is kind of a repetition. I think we're running out of time. Would like to tell you something. I mentioned something about the importance of new techniques as Alzheimer was using silver. This is what happens today. These three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize, uh, Dubochet, Frank, and Anderson. Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. They. Uh, pioneering work for the use of cryo microscopy to solve high resolution structure of biomolecules has provided unprecedented insights into the complexity of life. And they've done tremendous uh, service to the scientific community. One of the uh, pupil of Anderson has been involved in the study of Alzheimer's and peak disease. And Dr. Scheres, in collaboration with Dr. Goddard, myself, and others, we have analyzed uh, cases of Alzheimer's disease and peak disease to analyze 
the core of the filaments using this uh, cryo electromicroscopy. The principle is to isolate the structure of tau, the filaments, and then freeze them, um, and then by the cryo-electromicroscope generate many pictures that then are allowing a three-dimensional reconstruction of the structure. So this is a patient of 74 years uh, of age when, when she uh, passed away. She had history of Alzheimer's disease for 10 years. So I studied this patient very well. She had no mutations causing Alzheimer, no APP, presenilin 1 or presenilin 2. So this was an ideal candidate for us to study cryo-electromicroscopy. Also because she had a tremendous number of tangles, as you can see here, by fluorescence. So it was ideal for that reason. And the tangles were numerous, not only in the cortex, but throughout other uh, subcortical structure. And so this is how the filaments were seen in 1991 in a case of Alzheimer's disease, while now, today, with this uh, high resolution, one can um, see them very sharply and really construct a model to understand what the core of the protein is. And this is the, a paper that was published last year showing in Alzheimer's disease, we, we have paired helical filaments and straight filaments. The paired helical filaments show this, you know, beta strand that unlike the one of the straight filament, as you can see here, they are aligned in the uh, in, uh, same, uh, uh, the strands are aligned, while in the paired helical filaments, they are not in the same position. So the model has been uh, created. Um, this would be the paired helical filaments at this level. It has been determined what the sequence composing the core of the filaments is, which amino acid are uh, the, the core of the straight filament and of the paired helical filaments. So this has been a major uh, step forward. It has been shown that the portion of tau composing the core of the filament is from 306 to 378, while we use the longest isoform of tau. So this portion of tau constitutes the core of the filaments. And here you can see the, um, the pair and straight filaments. And we have determined that they are composed of repeat number three and repeat number four. So this is the sequence of the uh, filament. There is a very interesting structure here that has been called beta solenoid, which apparently has some similarity with the structure of some uh, uh, prion in yeast. And so this has been speculated that it's possible that the reason why tau propagate might be related to this structure. This is the beta solenoid here. So tau is a very complex protein that has not been really ever crystallized before. This is the first time that the structure of the core is determined. The rest of the protein is called fuzzy coat, and so the core is composed of repeat three and four.
Now, following that study, we have studied other cases, including cases with dominant Alzheimer's disease. And it has been confirmed that the structure of the peridolical filaments and straight filaments is the same in other cases, including cases with APP mutation and cases of atypical Alzheimer with, uh, for instance, presentation of uh, posterior cortical atrophy. So these are images from this following case number two, sporadic case, and then from this family that we reported in the early 90s with the mutation V717F. From that, one brain was studied by cryo and has shown the same structure. We have done cases of peak disease, and recently, we have been able to publish the structure of the filaments in peak disease. And this is showing something very dramatically different. So in peak disease, there are two types of filament, the wide peak filament and the narrow peak filaments. All this was not seen clearly by classic electron microscopy. But now we have clarity on this. And this is the structure of the narrow filament that, oh, sorry, that is quite different. There is a, the two filaments are one next to the other. Alzheimer fold, as I said, from 306 to 378. The peak fold, 254 to 378. But what is also very important is the different configuration, the different structure, the different fold. So this is the first time that is shown that uh, tau in these two different diseases have different conformations. So in conclusion, the ordered cores of tau filaments from peak disease adopt a single novel fold, which is distinct from that in Alzheimer's disease, establishing the existence of molecular conformers. Molecular conformers share concept secondary structure motif but have markedly different conformations at turn residues, resulting in distinct cross beta packing. Structural basis for selective isoform incorporation and phosphorylation in peak disease compared to Alzheimer's disease. Now, the protein tau is fundamental for structure and function of neurons. Conformational changes of tau and tau loss of function lead to multiple neurodegenerative diseases, sporadic or hereditary. Disorders caused by diverse tau structural changes have different cellular, anatomical, and clinical signatures. Early detection of tau pathology is essential for therapeutic intervention. Knowledge of conformation alterations of tau and of atomic structures of tau filaments is a necessary step for developing imaging tracers and for aiming at targeting each of tau pathology conformations. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the future now <laughs> is uh, yes. following this sort of information is to develop the proper imaging and therapeutic. Yes. So we need the pharmacologists, and we need uh, the imaging people to uh, study this and move forward. Yes. So uh, y thank you very much for your uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, I recognize uh, one slide uh, which showed the uh, PET imaging of the uh, yeah. maybe tau. Yes. Top. So uh, as you said, uh, it's an, uh, under debate that we at this point we don't have satisfactory PET imaging uh, for all 
So uh, which shows the both the three repeat or four repeat DAOs. So yes, yes. What do you think uh, is important for the future uh, DAO pet imaging? Well, we do not have a therapy, but it will be eventually possible to do an early diagnosis. And as soon as therapeutic intervention will be possible, one will be able to you know, interfere with this tau deposition. There are interesting studies going on in uh, Dr. Eisenberg's laboratory in, uh, at UCLA, where they're doing some tau inhibitors that basically this is still work in vitro, but the idea is to stop the uh, expansion, this you know, process of tau seeding uh, by capping you know, the, the, the filament structure. So this is you know, work that is much beyond my understanding, very molecular, um, molecular biology. But I mean, this is what is happening in some laboratories. So that if one has the ligand that shows the very early deposition, then one could intervene with a very specific therapy. I mean, this is the hope. Okay. So any questions? Is um, 20 to 40 percent, am I right, of FDLD patient in Western country um, are diagnosed as familial disease? Yes. And uh, however, in Asian countries, almost all of them are sporadic, not familial. Uh -huh. So are there any molecular biological differences between Western and Asian FDD or FDLD patient? Well, that is a very good question. So the fact that you do not see familial has to do with um, also uh, the way family interact, maybe. I mean, I cannot imagine that there is such difference in genetics. Obviously, Asians, we're talking about the multiple races. So um, there's not much. I start to see some uh, familial neurodegenerative diseases coming from in the Chinese literature. And certainly there are tau mutations in Japan. I mean, this has been reported by, uh, I know this, uh, I think is the, I can not remember right now, but I think it's a P31S mutation has been seen in Japan. And uh, so I don't know how to answer your question, really. Are there differences uh, in genetic? What is, what is your opinion? I, I think that in part has to do with the um, way family are dealing with this problem. And perhaps there is not much, um, uh, they're not so open to disclose, maybe. Is this a cultural or is this a biological difference? I don't know. So I think we do have uh, biological uh, differences uh, between European or uh, American uh, and uh, Japanese uh, populations. And uh, we do have tau mutation in Japan, but uh, it's not uh, familial. Uh, it's uh, sporadic. And uh, we don't, we rarely have, uh, I'm not sure, no. Uh, we. We do have very rare uh, chromosome 72 mutations in Japan. So uh, they definitely have differences uh, between the uh, mutation pattern or uh, chromosome 
or differences, I think. So the mutations so far are in Caucasians, the majority. And so they must have started in Europe. So eventually, then the question is whether it is between European and Japanese. Also, we do have some symptom differences, I think, uh, because uh, we do not have much uh, hallucinations uh -huh. or auditory, and auditory hallucinations. So uh, Snowden and uh, other researchers in Europe have documented uh, auditory hallucinations and prosecutive delusions in European uh, populations, but we do not so so much see, see. The, um, such a delusional or, or, or hallucinatory uh, patients in Japan. And how about mutations of presenilin 1? Because I know some have it's, been reported. Yes, yes, I don't yes. know the frequency. I'm not sure the frequency. Not much. I think we have less confirmation than the one new mutations. Yes. Compared to the Caucasians, I think there are some differences between Caucasians and Japanese. Hmm. That's interesting. Thank you. One more question. Hi. Uh, thank you for the uh, nice talk. And I'm 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 impressed with the uh, conformational changes of tau. And they and you told us that there is a uh, Alzheimer type uh, like this one and pig type. And are they related to the four repeat tau and three repeat tau or you, um, you told me that three uh, Alzheimer disease patients have three repeat tau's, and uh, pig type has uh, four repeats, or they they may have three, uh, okay, three so, repeats. So here, mm -hmm. what has been found, studied, is the core of the filaments, mm -hmm. and the core in Alzheimer is um, the third and fourth repeat. And in peak is the second, third, and fourth repeat that are forming the, uh, the core. So this is the core. Then the participation in, uh, in, the, in the formation of the um, filaments, the, you know, the filaments, then um, in Alzheimer's disease, there is participation of all six mm -hmm. because, because repeat number three and four are in all six. Okay. So is there um, any possibilities that uh, he was talking about the detect, uh, detecting uh, taos by the... Um, right, uh, right. And, and so right now, uh -huh. yes, you are saying how to mm -hmm. develop different ligands. Yes. Right. So right now, there is a study in progress to see uh, whether the ligand that is used for Alzheimer tau right now, where it binds. So there is a cryo-EM work mm -hmm. going on to determine the uh, relationship between that ligand. Mm -hmm. Now, developing a ligand for peak, mm -hmm. that is something that eventually will have to be done. Mm -hmm. So the, the ligand has, that is working well now, has some structural similarity to thioflavin S. Mm -hmm. And as I showed, okay. thioflavin S mm -hmm. doesn't show mm -hmm. the peak bodies. So there is something that the chemist will have to work to find where this um, 
affinity occurs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not a chemist, yeah, but, so this yeah, is, yeah. this is very difficult yeah. to understand how mm -hmm. they can approach the problem. But I mean, the facts are this: that the, the ligand for Alzheimer tau works well mm -hmm. yeah, as affinity. That, that all started by the thioflavin. Mm -hmm. You know this. Yeah, I know. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, we still need to. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Hey, Ito-sensei. Thank you very much. Uh, very stimulating uh, uh, talks. Uh, my question is: uh, Recently, many groups tried to establish immunotherapy against tau, like amyloid. So, but uh, uh, tau is accumulated in cell cytoplasmic inclusion. Do you have? Uh, any idea or a comment uh, about uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, immunotherapy against tau? Well, is, I know, uh, is it a success? I know that there's groups working to develop new antibodies. Uh, I think it's going to be very uh, complex because basically, uh, you know, particularly for the tauopathy where tau is present in us, in glia and in neurons, I think it would be very challenging to be able to uh, stop the disease. Uh, so there are several issues. One is the uh, going through the blood-brain barrier, then cellular membrane. So there are different approaches that I know are being followed. Uh, maybe the antibody can be a possibility, but there are also other techniques that people have been considered using viral vector and things like that. Thank you very much. Yes, ka. Okay, thank you very much, uh, you. Professor Getty, you. for your wonderful lecture. Thank you.